Father, we ask that you send your Holy Spirit with us at all times to guide us to trust your word. Your word, not the words of fallen sinful man. If there appears a conflict, Lord, let us find out what is wrong with our ideas so that we can blend them with your ideas. We know that your word does not change. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so tonight we're talking about the dating game. And for those of you who thought this was a quiz show or a, you're going to win prizes or something, no, you know, that's not going to happen because we're not talking about romance. Uh, but how do, how are these dates determined when you read this stuff in the newspaper? Well, we got this bone over here that's 1.5 million years old, and we think this, we think that uh, about it. But uh, now I'm old enough to remember, you used to make it back 30, 40 years ago, when you might actually see in the newspaper something like, uh, this bone is believed to be, we think, you never see that anymore. It's like, it's got the date on it, it's like it's been stamped, and that's all there is to it. And there's never an explanation as to how that date was arrived at, you know, where'd they, where'd they get that from? Well, uh, and we know that, <laughs> wouldn't it be convenient if you dug up a rock or a bone and it had a little tag on it, made in China, 3 billion BC, you know? But that's not the case, you know, you, 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 you have to guess, you have to find out uh, uh, clues, shall we say. And the best eyewitness, or the best, uh, best dating method is an eyewitness account, the historical record. Uh, someone was there, and they wrote it down, this is what happened, this is when it happened. Uh, that's the best evidence, and that's pretty rare to come out. But, you know, like I say, the bones and the rocks don't come with those. So the most important thing you need to know about dating is assumptions are required. No matter if I'm telling you, and I think I may have mentioned something a couple of months ago, we talked about uh, Noah and the flood. I might have mentioned about salt in the oceans. I can't remember if I did that here or not. Uh, and I'm making a point about that. That's all well and good, but there are assumptions required even for that. You assume, for example, that uh, originally the oceans had no salt. And when you do that, that's how you can get up to a maximum age of 62 million years. <coughs> which is well beyond the biblical time scale, but it's well short of the four and a half billion years that the evolutionists are telling us that the Earth is. So you can set a maximum age there, but you made an assumption. So if that assumption was wrong, let's say there was some salt there to start with, that just changes your, your uh, time scale. So all dating methods require assumptions. One thing you could judge a little bit is, how valid is this assumption seem to be. You know, is this kind of way off the wall? Is it realistic? And uh, in that sense, the biblical creationist has a little bit of advantage because they're making assumptions about things that are only going to take place for a few thousand years instead of billions of years. So if you make an assumption that something's going to not change over billions of years, that's getting a little farther out. So you have to decide which one of those <coughs> makes sense. Um, okay, where should we base our thinking, of course, is on the Bible. Everything that we're going to think about in life, really, if we go to God's Word first, which does not change, then uh, we should be going there first. If there appears to be a conflict, I have to disagree a little bit with Andy Stanley here, if there appears to be a conflict between what the Bible says and what somebody else says, let's find out where they might have made a mistake, instead of saying, God, you got it wrong, because we figured out we know more than you do, and uh, that's not going to all right, so how do they date these uh, <coughs> fossils? How do they date rocks and so on? Um, you've probably seen something like this at one time or another. It's called the geologic column. I don't know if that looks familiar. Uh, and they've got these nifty little terms here from the bottom. Precambrian, Cambrian, Ordovician, Silurian, Devonian, Mississippi, Pennsylvania, Permian, Triassic, Jurassic, and so on up the line. Really neat words you can't pronounce. And uh, the whole idea is, that uh, down at the bottom are the oldest, and, uh, and, and this one now has the pictures of some of these critters on the side, and these are supposed to be like index fossils, so that you find the simpler ones at the bottom. And we pause here for a moment to say, first of all, if it's alive, it's not simple. <coughs> the simplest cell is more complex than the city. 
So if it's alive, it's not simple to start with. Yes, it's true that a mima is not uh, as, as complex as a human being, but uh, anyway, that's, you're familiar with that story, that how things evolve gradually into more and more complex <coughs> as you go up the line. So, uh, what should we talk about here? A, 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 a principle of geology. Now this is going to get heavy. All right. Physics, <coughs> yeah, I mean, you guys, I don't know if you're going to be able to follow this. But here's the idea, that you find these rocks, and if there's a layer down here, and then there's a layer on top of that, and there's a layer on top of that, and they call that the principle of superposition, and they're saying, am I going too fast for you? Okay, they're saying that this layer went down first, and then this one came later, and then this one came last. All right. Can we go over that again? No. Okay. It's really pretty simple, isn't it? And it's very logical. We would all assume that. The only problem is that most of the time it's wrong. Why is that? Well, it works if you're talking about a very placid pond or lake where nothing is going on. But if water is moving, then that's a different story. Now, a fellow by the name of Dr. Guy Berthaud, he's a Frenchman, so it's G-U-Y, but this is Guy Berthaud, did a bunch of uh, experiments a number of years ago, I believe it was at Colorado State University, and I've got a video I could have shown you, except it's an old VHS tape, and I have to find a machine to put that in. But um, he did these experiments in a flume tank, and what he determined was that these layers are laid down at the same time. And it all depends on how much sediment is in the water, how fast the water is moving. He did a whole bunch of different experiments. And it was, in fact, the video is called Experiments in Stratification. And so uh, it does make a, a, a big difference if the water is moving. So, for example, I have done some magnificent artwork. <laughs> As you can clearly see, these are stratified layers of rocks, kind of like Grand Canyon. I'm sure you recognize it immediately, right? Okay. This is a dead fish. This is a dead fish. All right? Now, if you... You laughing at my artwork? <laughs> so what would an evolutionist tell us about this fish as compared to this fish? Anybody? The bottom one is older. It's older. This guy was buried earlier. And depending on how many layers and how they're doing their counting, maybe millions of years, this, this guy was buried down here. Of course, they would make this a, a simpler fish than that fish because they have to evolve into the one at the top, right? But guess what? What we find out when the water is moving, and let's say, I don't know, some of you can't see this arrow here, the water's going this way now. All right? So actually what's happening as this keeps progressing this way, as the water is flowing this way, all these layers are being laid down at the same time. It's just going, and this has been observed. Uh, one place is in Australia where they're trying to save a, a reef area in there, kind of where it's been washed out, trying to uh, dredge and, and refill that. And also in these flume tank experiments, uh, so it's been tested experimentally. So actually what's happening is, as the water's flowing this way, then all these layers, like that. Now, which fish was buried first? Right. This guy was buried here before it progressed over to here. Was he buried millions of years before this one? No, depending on how fast the water is flowing, could have been a few seconds, a few minutes. Uh, depending on, the, on our scale here of what the distance is, it might have been a day if it's, you know, these are miles apart or something. But the point is, they're buried very rapidly and not too far, far apart from each other. And this guy actually got covered up first. So it doesn't matter how high he is, it matters where he was in relation to where the water is flowing. So, uh, and, and do you think the water might have been flowing in a global flood? Yeah, we could have some real movement going on there. So, um, uh, it, the superposition sounds real good, 
and it works probably okay in your little wading pool in the backyard if nothing else is going on, but not necessarily in, in real life. Uh, now, how do they get these dates that they come up with? Let's say you go over to Otterbein, Ohio Weston, or the Ohio State University, and uh, you go into the geology professor's office, and you say, excuse me, professor, how do you know that your rock that you found here is the age that you say it is? And he'll say, well, that's easy. You see, because we find this index fossil in that rock. So that, we know how old it is. Oh, okay. That sounds good. So you walk out of his office, and you go down the hall into the paleontology professor's office. Paleontology, these are the guys that study fossils. Sir, how do you know how old that fossil is? Well, that's easy, because we found it in this rock layer. So the fossils date the rocks. The rocks date the fossils. Date the rocks. Date the fossils. That's called circular reasoning. The good old boys got together and said, here's what we're going to call these layers, and here's the ages we're going to assign to them, and we're going to agree that we find these fossils in here, that that's how we're going to coordinate it, but it's circular reasoning. There's nothing absolute about it, so we know what the, what the ages are. So um, this column is not as it's depicted. And they will tell you, in fact, if you remember that, uh, I don't know if any of you saw that debate between Ken Ham and Bill Nye, who's back in 2014, I think, around February. And Bill Nye put a picture up there that showed, well, it was actually not nearly as impressive as this one, but it was, uh, and it showed a little fish in there. And he said, this little guy never climbs up to another layer. You know, if anybody finds him anywhere else, you win the Nobel Prize or something like that. Well, I got news for Bill Nye. They're all over the place. This column, you know, this thing's in the book here, but as time has gone by and we keep finding more and more fossils, you find them in a much wider range than is depicted. Uh, much, much wider, so you can find them in a lot of different places, so they're not narrowly restricted to just one area. Uh, so, we're, uh, if we were gonna, if we could go anywhere we wanted in the world today, where could we go maybe to find this geologic column exposed for us to take a look at the whole thing? Anybody got an idea? Grand Canyon. Excellent, excellent answer. It's wrong, but it's an excellent answer. <laughs> no, that's what we would all think, wouldn't we? Problem with the Grand Canyon is some of the layers are out of place. There's, there's one, and the scientists, they come up with these really neat terms. There's a place where there's, there's two layers like this, and they call this the Great Unconformity. Why do they call it the Great Unconformity? Because there's 200 million years missing there. And if one of you has taken them, the National Park Service would like for you to return it, please. Because it really messes things up with 200 million years missing out of there. So in fact, the closer you look at the Grand Canyon, it is screaming catastrophe. And not this long uniformitarian thing of, of building up layers over millions of years. So, uh, but there is one place on planet Earth that you can find this geologic column. You know where that is. We're looking at it in the textbook, in the textbook, from bottom to top. You know, there, there are certainly you can go to different places on the earth. You can find segments that seem to line up. You know, but uh, the whole thing from bottom to top, no, you don't find that. All right, so now we are going to go take a field trip right here in this room. We're not going to Grand Canyon, but we're going to go out west. And this is out west. This kind of looks a little bit like Grand Canyon, and you can see. Uh, we got a person here in a red shirt for scale, and from about here at the bottom, about where they're standing, up to this next, you see the pretty pronounced layer here, uh, where it's a little bit different color, and, uh, and then we've got all these other layers here, and this is about 25 feet, a little more than 25 feet of sedimentary layers, and they are very, they're down to like a millimeter. There are thousands, even hundreds of thousands of these layers just in that 25 foot segment. So, you know, typically, if you take a geologist out there, blindfold him, first of all, drop him in where he doesn't know where he, where he is, and say, uh, tell me, how long did it take for all these layers? They'd be, they'd be counting all these things up and say, wow, we've got hundreds of thousands of years here, maybe a million years. Okay, 
Well, as it happens, in this case, we know exactly how long it took for all these layers to form. Anybody have an idea? <laughs> you in the back. This is what I'm <laughs> <laughs> he says, Do you remember, remember what I told you? <laughs> Mount St. Helens? Mount St. Helens, three hours. All those layers were laid down in three hours from 9 p.m. to midnight on June the 12th, 1980, as a part of this Mount St. Helens eruption. Does that prove that Grand Canyon had those layers laid rapidly? No. Proves it certainly could have been, because we've seen it right here. Uh, see, we've seen it happen. All right, also in the Mount St. Helens area is uh, Oh, I can't think of what they call this. Not Miners uh, Canyon. Anyway, uh, this is the Toodle River that flows very near Mount St. Helens. And there is a canyon there carved out that's a 140th scale Grand Canyon. Average is 140 feet deep. It's a complete scale model Grand Canyon, complete with side canyons and everything. I'll give you another view of it here. And uh, so again, if you typically if you take somebody out there and say, "What? Well, how did this happen?" Say, "Well, the Tula River cut through this over millions of years." Not the case, because again, we happen to know how long this took. One day, March 19th, 1982. This was a result of a pyroclastic mud flow from Mount St. Helens as a aftermath of the and a pyroclastic mud flow is just a the ice and stuff at the, stop, at the top was melted by the heat and the mud and everything coming down and it carved this out in one day. One day is all it took. The Tula River is not capable of doing that. In fact, the whole world is full of these uh, underfit canyons or underfit rivers where they, uh, the river cannot accomplish the task, just like the Colorado could not have cut the, the, the Grand Canyon. And, uh, so this thing happens in one day. And again, does that prove the Grand Canyon was carved out very rapidly? No, it proves it certainly could have been because we see it happen right here. And that is uh, more and more geologists, even secular geologists today, are coming along to the Reach Dam theory where we've got up north and east of the Grand Canyon a, a huge lake, which we would say left over from flood, uh, which that dam is breached and all of a sudden and you do find the remains of the material here, out there in San Diego somewhere off in the ocean. So it's, you know, flowed through there. So the Colorado River cannot cut the Grand Canyon because the north rim is after 1,500 feet higher than, so unless water flows uphill and then it starts coming back down again, that doesn't work. But uh, one day it cuts this one. So we could really have that happen rapidly. I think we talked before, uh, I guess maybe on the, on the flood talk we did about the, the bent rocks, you know, you can't bend a rock or fold it over. If you have warm sediments that are not yet uh, hardened into rock, they're flexible, and you have this tectonic activity, then you can get the bending taking place, and you can have something like this where it can carve through there rather rapidly uh, with that mud flow that took place in Mount St. Helens. So the fact is, there are hundreds of physical processes that set limits on the age of the world. When I said like the amount of salt in the ocean is 62 million years, it doesn't say that it's that old, so it can't be any older than that. It can't possibly be any older than that, which rules out the four and a half billion. Other things you can work into the equation that make it possible for it to be a shorter time frame, but hundreds of processes that'll do that, and guess what? Over 90% of them say absolutely no to the billions of years. And they're quite consistent with scripture. So what, what, what discipline of science do you know where somebody would be doing experiments and observations and 90% of their evidence goes this way and you throw that in the wastebasket and you embrace the 10% or less than 10%? Wouldn't it be more likely to say, boy, I've got 90% of the weight of the evidence here. There's 10% here that's not exactly saying billions of years, but it leaves open long said, that's what I'm going to latch on to. And they do that, of course, because they have to have the time. They don't, they know they can't convince you that a frog turns into a prince overnight. So 
we got to take you know millions of years for that to happen. So they got to have the time, but the uh, the evidence says otherwise. So you're saying well, that's all well and good, Steve, but this is all old stuff, and uh, now we've got these new modern radiometric dating techniques, so they don't even use this anymore. Wrong. What you've just seen is pretty much how things are done. Yes, there are radiometric, <coughs> radiometric uh, processes that they use now. And uh, what happens? Well, uh, you do it the old-fashioned way. You find a bone, and it's this far deep, and you know how old you want it to be, because you want it to be probably older than your rival professor found last week, <laughs> so that you can get your name published in the paper. And so uh, if, the, if you happen to do a, a test on it, and it says a time different, you just toss it away. If you think it's this old and the radiometric date happens to agree with that, then it's, you write your paper out, this, we found this, da, 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 that's how old it is, and radiometric te uh, testing confirms this date. And then it'll get in there with the footnotes and the references. Uh, if it doesn't agree, you won't see it. You know, it's, 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 so it's not relied on. In other words, it's not the radiometric dating that said, oh, this is the way it is. Now we've got to go back and reevaluate what we thought before. Like those Laetoli footprints that are clearly human. Oh, they had to be made by Lucy because, because we know humans weren't there then. So uh, anyway, the, the radiometric dating, which we're going to get into here. Oh, and by the way, uh, when you go to, if you want to send something into one of and there's not very many labs that do this. You go to send something into a lab. <clears throat> And I've got a form to fill out. Guess what one of the questions is on the form? How old do you think it is? Think it is? <laughs> exactly. Uh, why is that? Well, they might say so we can kind of calibrate our machines and kind of, you know, so. Well, of course, they're in the business to do this testing. And if all their customers are getting dates that don't agree with what they wanted, they may not get as much business. So uh, I think that might have a little effect on shading where they come out with there, but uh, that's, seriously, I've had several geologists tell me that because they've sent these in for testing. So that's one of the questions. How old do you think it <clears throat> They go ahead and do their tests. Okay. Has anybody so, ever written, I don't know, you tell me? <laughs> <laughs> that's why I'm sending you the rock. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so let's get into this a little bit <clears throat> in radiometric dating. And one of those is carbon-14, which we touched on very briefly, I think, uh, a couple months ago. Uh, what do you need to know about carbon-14? Well, first of all, the carbon-14 test can only be done on organic materials, that is, things that were once alive. Trees, animals, uh, has to have been alive. You don't do a carbon-14 test on a rock. So uh, it's, it's limited in that way. Where do we get carbon-14? Well, our atmosphere is about 80% nitrogen, 20% oxygen. To be exact, it's more like 78 nitrogen, 21 oxygen, and 1% carbon dioxide and others. Which, by the way, the carbon dioxide is a small part of that 1%, and the part that man adds to it is an infinitesimally small part of that. So drive your SUV, you're not going to, you're not going to warm the planet. And I'm not saying we should be wasteful of God's resources by any means, but the, the fact is that the correlation between activity on the sun and these changes in temperature climate changes is much closer correlation than anything we have to do. And uh, I won't get into that now, but you've got some, some examples provided by the National Park Service to, to show us when we were on a, a cruise up to Alaska with the Answers to Genesis and they put these forms out and said, see, you can see what global warming has done. And, uh, and we're looking at the numbers. I said, oh yeah? Uh, all this happened prior to 1850, so I don't think we had any too many choo-choos then, or, or, or semi trucks, or any of that stuff. So, uh, in fact, there are some. When you look at their at their chart, there are some areas where the ice has actually increased uh, over that period of time. So, anyway, sorry to get off on a sidetrack there, but we've got uh, approximately 80 percent nitrogen. Okay, last month. Uh, I had a, a slide up on the screen here showing that uh, the sun is sending all these particles of radiation toward the earth. Fortunately, the earth has a magnetic field which uh, helps protect us from those dangerous things. 
And we talked about how the magnetic field is getting weaker and weaker. It was, I think, 20 times stronger at the time of Adam and Eve. Maybe that's one of the reasons people lived longer back then. I don't know. But the point is that the magnetic field helps weed that out, but it doesn't get all of them. So you've got these uh, neutrons and, and things banging around out there. Well, they, every once in a while, will smack into a nitrogen atom and knock something loose. And uh, I'm sure you all remember this from chemistry class. Handy dandy shirt here. This is the periodic table of the elements. And when I was in chemistry class, I never gave a thought to God, the creator of the universe, or whatever. But it, it really, as I was looking at this thing and studying it, I thought, isn't it neat how well organized this is? You've got metals in one area and have similar characteristics and so on. Anyway, uh, there's a, every element has an atomic number, and the atomic number for uh, carbon is six. It's just number, number of protons in the nucleus. And for nitrogen, it's seven. Then you have an atomic weight or atomic mass, which is about double that, because you normally have the same number of neutrons as protons, and then you got some electrons that don't weigh very much, because they've been on a diet. <laughs> so, but the main thing, that, the thing that determines what the element is, is the number. So carbon is six, and nitrogen is seven. Okay, so we have this collision. And now we've got an atom with only six protons instead of seven, that is no longer a nitrogen atom. It's a carbon atom because it's only got six protons. But the weight is still about 14 instead of 12 like normal carbon. Now we've got carbon 14. It is not stable. Okay, it is radioactive. And so it's gonna have radioactive decay. So uh, we have like uh, there's also a carbon-13, but carbon-13 is also stable like carbon-12 is. Carbon-13 is uh, about 1 in 100 carbon atoms is carbon-13. About 1 in 1 trillion is carbon-14. So not a whole lot of that around. 1 in 1 trillion atoms is carbon-14. But we can detect it and it's there. Uh, it will attach to oxygen in the atmosphere to make carbon. CO2, carbon dioxide, only it's carbon-14 dioxide. And so it's in the atmosphere. We breathe it in. Plants, of course, take in carbon dioxide. <clears throat> animals eat the plants. We eat the animals. We eat the plants. We breathe the air. You are all radioactive. You have carbon-14 in your bodies right now. Now, here's a fact you may not have been aware, be aware of. When you die, you stop breathing, eating, and drinking. That's when the clock starts. Because now you're no longer taking in any carbon-14. And at this point, it's going to start decaying. And that's what they're measuring to see how old something is. <clears throat> so, how long does that take? Well, uh, the half-life of carbon-14 is about 5,700 years. Let's round that off to 6,000. And say we have this much carbon-14. 6,000 years later, you have half as much. 6,000 years later, you have half as much or a quarter of the original. So because of that decay rate, you cannot measure anything with carbon-14 to be older than about 80,000 years, a big stretch at the most 100,000 years, because there's not enough left to detect. So you'll occasionally see someone refer to, well, millions of years of carbon-14 in the same sentence. It doesn't belong. You can't can't do that. Uh, carbon-14 is only for, for uh, organic materials and things that uh, Theoretically, only up to maybe about 80,000 years old. Um, and half-life, I've talked about that, how much, you know, as it, as it decays. It's not a linear thing. <coughs> Excuse me. So, uh, if, for example, the entire Earth was 100% carbon-14 atoms and nothing else, what's the number here? Uh, there would be nothing left in less than a million years. Nothing, you know, because of that decay rate. So, well, a million years, you say, why do you say 80,000? Well, the entire Earth is not totally carbon-14. It's only one atom in a trillion of the carbon atoms. So it, uh, it doesn't last nearly that long. All right, so uh, would anyone want to waste money testing a dinosaur bone? 
carbon-14. I mean, we know they're 65 million years old at least, right? So, what's the point? Well, recently there have been some carbon-14 tests done on various dinosaur bones. Guess what? They measure in the thousands of years. And you should not find any. You should not find any in there at all. And uh, if that's not bad enough, um, even coal, diamonds, diamonds are really hard. You can't get any contamination in there. And there have been diamonds tested with dates of thousands of years that are, we're told that they're like 1.3 million years old. How can that be? There cannot be any carbon-14 left in there. So to really be accurate in calibrating the scale for carbon-14, all you need is a zero point, right? That should be easy. Just go out and find something that's got no carbon-14 in it, and then you can adjust your calibration to be more accurate. The only problem is, we have not yet found a single example of anything, whether it's a bone, a coal, a diamond, anything that you're going to measure, that we can't measure carbon-14 in it, and not only measure it, but have it be pretty well above the threshold of our ability to detect it. So that means it's not even 80,000 years old, it's much less than that. So we've got dinosaur bones tested now in the thousands of years. Yes, more than what the biblical time scale is, like it might be a particular bone, might say 55,000 years, for example. Well, there are some problems with the carbon-14 dating. Again, assumptions that are made, and uh, so that can bring those dates down. But the point is, no way can it be billions of years, or even millions of years. Can it possibly be because we can find the carbon-14 in all of these items? Okay. Uh, let's take a look at three of the 14 assumptions required for radiometric dating. And, uh, whoops, hmm. there they are. Okay. And these are pretty simple. But now, that, again, 14 assumptions you got to make right away. You know, how accurate can this be? But these are pretty easy to understand. The uh, system has to have a starting point where no daughter product atoms are present, only parent atoms. So, for example, uh, if we shift over now to a longer term dating method, uranium to lead. Uranium-238, and so you assume that your sample was originally 100% uranium-238, no lead-206, or any of the other daughter products in between. So I'm not faulting the assumption other than, you know, and you have to make one. You have to have a starting point, so you have to assume that. That's number one. Number two, system has to be a closed system, no contamination from the outside or loss from the inside. Nobody is monkeying with it, all right? So, uh, no parent or daughter atoms are added to. Now, this is particularly troublesome, shall we say, with uranium. Uranium is very water soluble. So you've got here this sample, you say this is uranium in this rock here is so many billion years old. And uh, you know how they find uranium? They test the streams and the rivers, for, you know, to kind of trace it back because it's so water soluble. So this sample that you're testing the data, you're going to say, well, this thing has never been rained on. It's never, you know, that's a pretty, uh, or as I've, most of you are old enough to remember Johnny Carson and Ed McMahon, and uh, what they said, they went that routine with Karnak the Great, <coughs> and so these, this has been sealed in a mayonnaise jar in Funkin' Wagon's porch or something like that. That's what your sample has to be for billions of years, so that nothing can get to it. So that assumption is questionable. And then the rate of decay has remained constant from the beginning. And that's another one. All three of these are kind of questionable, and they've actually all now been proven to be wrong. And they've been proven by a group called the Rate Group, Radioisotopes in the Age of the Earth, R-A-T-E. And this is a group of eight PhD scientists that spent about eight years studying various aspects of this radioactivity. And uh, they have pretty much proven that all three of those Assumptions are not valid, so that makes it rough to do your to do your testing. Um, and an example, and this is a lot of examples like this, but this particular one uh, was from Australia, and they've got some volcanic rock that they were testing using one of these other methods that we'll talk about, and it comes out to be 45 million years old, and they 
crack it open and inside is wood, part of a tree or something, there's wood inside. Do a carbon-14 test on the wood, 45,000 years old. How can we have 45,000 year old wood encased in 45 million year old rock? Big problem. Big problem. Okay. Um, let me give you another example. And this would be uh, uh, some rock samples that were sent. Uh, there are, I think, maybe three or four labs, maybe in the world. I don't know who does this, but. They were sent to two different labs, these rock samples, and to be tested. And they were tested using three different methods, the uranium lead, rubidium strontium, and potassium argon. Okay, so here's lab A testing this sample with three different methods, and they got three different dates. Lab B, three different methods, three different dates. And oh, by the way, lab B doesn't agree with lab A either. So, uh, and I don't, I used to have a chart, I don't know where I put it, and I, or I couldn't get a slide up for you, but I can tell you that the total range was this rock was anywhere from 350,000 years old to 2.8 million years old. That's a big discrepancy, don't you think? So, but you haven't heard the best part. The rock in question was about 20 years old because it's a sample that was taken from the Mount St. Helens explosion. That rock didn't exist. And that, that, again, these rocks you also, you can't date like sedimentary rocks, only igneous rocks, the volcanic stuff, the lava uh, goes from liquid into solid form. And at that point is when your decay, decay clock starts ticking and you can start measuring these things. So here they're, they're measuring these rocks and they're 20 years old, and they're coming up with anywhere from 350,000 to 2.8 million. And there are lots of examples like that. Let me show you some more. And I've only put six on this chart. I could have shown you 19 that I know of. There's probably more than that. Here's uh, Mount Edna that was known age is 29 years, but they dated at 0.35 million. I put Stromboli in in case anybody was hungry. And uh, here's Huolai there 200 years ago, and it's dated at 22.8 million. 200 years ago, this is a historical record. We know when the thing erupted. Do you know where the, where the lava trails are for it? Uh, Medicine Lake, less than 500 years, and they showed it at 12.6 million. And again, I can show you a total of 19 of these. So the question is, if the dates of the rocks of known age are dated so wildly inaccurately, why would we want to trust the dates on a rock we don't know the age of? When the ones that we do, they get it all wrong. So not reliable, not reliable at all. All right, let's take a look at one decay chain here. And this is uranium to lead in 14 easy steps. And you got all these really neat things, uranium, thorium, protactinium, uranium, thorium, radium. These are different isotopes, by the way. Uranium-234 is compared to 238. <coughs> and uh, you wind up down, and these are all unstable, radioactive, until you get to the bottom. Lead-206 is stable. <coughs> all the electrons are happy. All the protons are happy. Every, you know, uh, lead is lead. I guess it is poisonous if you eat it, but it's not radioactive, okay? So that's how you get there. But there's some, there's some curious uh, things here in this uh, decayed chain that I want to show you. And that's the uh, three elements or uh, isotopes here of polonium. You've got uh, polonium-210 down here has a half-life of 134 days. That's not too long. Polonium-218 has a half-life of three minutes. Polonium-214 has a half-life of 164 micro seconds. That's millionths of a second. Polonium-214 does not last very long. Why is that significant? Well, a guy by the name of Dr. Robert Gentry, uh, quite a few years ago, did a lot of research on this, and he found uh, what are called polonium halos in the basement granite rocks all over the earth. It is the oldest rocks 
and he's got these things in here. What's a floating <coughs> halo? Let's take a look. Now, uh, before I let's let's hit one other topic first. We are told the Earth was a molten blob of liquid rock that slowly cooled over hundreds of millions of years, you know, to become solid. And these polonium, polonium halos are like snapshots. I don't know if we got any camera buffs in here that are old enough to remember real cameras. <laughs> Not this digital nonsense. But you know, you have an adjustment, an f-stop for how big your aperture is, how much light you're gonna let in, and you have a shutter speed. Okay, so if you're gonna take a portrait of somebody out near, uh, it's getting near sunset, so you might shut that shutter speed down to maybe half a second or something so that you can let enough light in. You say, hold still please, you know, click. If you're going to uh, be photographing in a basketball game, and you're catching a fast break, you don't want the shutter speed at one half a second. You want it at maybe five hundredth of a second, maybe a thousandth of a second in order to capture, capture that. All right, so polonium halos, the polonium-214, are found in these basement rocks. And this halo in the rock, I mean, if that's liquid slowly cooling over, how do you catch that? On the other hand, if God said, let there be granite, and you can catch it right now in a, in a quick snapshot, it's very significant that he's finding these things. And this is what a, a diagram of these radio halos look like. And what's happening here is you have radioactive decay. You have uh, alpha decay, beta decay, beta plus decay, electron capture. There's several different kinds. But when, uh, for example, the alpha decay, if you picture a sphere, and here's this atom, and it's throwing out these particles. And uh, the uh, alpha particle is basically a helium nucleus, which will snatch an electron on the way out, becomes a helium atom. Very slippery, and they, we'll talk about that later. That gets out, you know, it's hard to contain helium. But the energy that's involved when this comes out of this, in a picture of sphere, the energy can be measured. These rings that they see as distortion in the crystals that these are in, there's a distortion in there caused by the damage. It's called a fission track when this thing goes out. And they've managed to identify, depending on how far the track is in this material which the element is. So you'll see up there there's some of this uh, 214 polonium uh, halo and some of the other ones. So that's how they determine what the element is. And I can show you what it looks like here. And now we're not, it's actually not a sphere. What they've done is they've cut a real super thin slice and put it in the microscope. And so instead of a sphere, you're kind of looking at a target. But they can measure these tracks, and again, they can tell by how far out it goes what the element is. So, uh, I don't get involved with this, <laughs> but you've got this, these damage tracks that show, first of all, how can we catch this thing when it's got a half-life of 164 microseconds, number one, and they're in the basement rocks, what's considered to be the oldest rocks. So what about that assumption that says we start with uranium-238 and nothing else? No daughter products. And if you remember that chart we run a little while ago, polonium-214 was down near the bottom. Some of those other elements have half-lives measured in millions of years. So a lot of time takes place before you should find a polonium-214 halo, any evidence of it. And of course, lead-206. Could have been lead-206 right at the beginning in this particular rock sample, but they're assuming no, it's an all uranium 238 So this, this is you know, some of the reasons that we really can't trust this. Now, don't misunderstand, I think the machines they have today are very good <coughs> at counting atoms. They can tell you, you know, what's going on. It's the interpretation based on your worldview again. What does that mean? And it's those assumptions, 14 different assumptions. And yet, something like as simple as this tells us that what well, these atoms, these daughter products, were there early on, and if we've captured them, like that, so it wasn't it wasn't in liquid rock. You know, this is this is uh, this, it doesn't it doesn't make sense. All right, now I have the question that Jason already knows the answer to. Is but I'll ask for the rest of you. Can somebody tell me how long that candle's been burning? Yeah, I guess we didn't see it lighted. We didn't oh. see it. <laughs> 
How do you know I live? Yeah, you just made an assumption. I did. Yeah. But I quickly backtracked. <laughs> yeah. Now you might be able to say, well, after church this morning, I peeked in here and I didn't see that candle. You might be able to narrow it down a little bit. All right. But you can't. You have. You don't know how long it's been burning, do you? Uh, how might we test it or try to find out? Measure how much it was burned off. There you go. You can kind of you can kind of measure it, see how tall it is. Uh, that really doesn't tell you a whole lot, but you could sit here for an hour and measure it again, right? And you say, well, it's burning at this rate, you know. That's providing I don't take it out of the glass and let the air accelerate it, you know, or do something else. So you can do uh, a number of things to try to get at it, but. You have to make assumptions. You, you can't. You cannot know. I know. Let you know a little secret because I did it. I really did. <laughs> so, but that is an eyewitness historical account, like we find in the Bible. All right. So, here's what we're going to do, and this is all you need to know about dating. All in a nutshell. And this is called The Parable of the Candle. It's written by a fellow by the name of Garth Weeb, or Weeby, W-I-E-B-E. And a very short little thing here. It's, uh, in, it's got four characters, the narrator, uh, Chris, Lucy, and Manuel. And you're in luck, I'm playing all four parts. <laughs> Best you can. But as you're listening to this, be thinking radiometric dating. <laughs> okay. Chris and Lucy entered a building looking for Manuel. In a room they found a note and a lighted candle. Chris looked at the note and read it aloud. Hi, it's 2.30 and I'm leaving to run some errands. I'll be back in a couple of hours. By the way, the electricity is out, so I'll leave a candle for you. Signed, Manuel. Lucy says, I know how we can find out how long it's been since he left. Look, the candle's been burning since he lit it. It has a significant amount of wax that's melted and dripped down. If we figure out what rate at which the wax is melting and measure the amount of wax that has thus far dripped, we can work backwards to find out how long it's been since he left. Chris says, why waste your time? The note says he left at 2.30. Lucy said, don't believe everything you read. Chris says, look, I've known Manuel for a long time. This is his handwriting. Don't be ridiculous. Lucy replies, ah, yes, but what does he mean by 2.30? A note like that is subject to interpretation. Suppose he was talking about another time zone or something. And so an argument ensued about the note. Uh, Lucy prevailed, insisted on performing measurement and calculations. A few minutes later, Lucy announced, well, I got some bad news for us. Based on the amount of wax that has melted and the rate at which the wax is melting, I can confidently tell you it's been at least a whole day since this guy left. He was probably talking about 2.30 yesterday. And since he said he'd be back in a couple of hours, we can assume something happened to him and he's not coming back at all. So much for you, note. Just then, Manuel walked in. Lucy said, are you this guy, Manuel? What took you so long? Manuel replied, What are you talking about? I left you a note saying I'll be back in a couple of hours. It hasn't even been that long. Lucy said, Never mind the note. I measured the amount of wax that stripped off your candle and the rate at which the wax was melting. I know you've been gone since yesterday. Manuel replied, First of all, that candle isn't burning nearly as brightly as when I first lit it. Second of all, I didn't light a new candle, but I used one. And thirdly, I used another candle to light this candle, and in the process, the wax from that candle dropped all over this one. Lucy says, so, you set the candle up to deceive us, to make it look like you left the room over a day ago, when in fact it's been less than a couple of hours. Manuel replied, look, left you a note telling you when I left. I never intended for you to conduct some silly experiment measuring candle wax. 
I put the candle there so you guys would have some light. God says, I'm not trying to deceive you. I don't want you to be in the dark. I left you a note. I left you a note. That's all you need to know about radiometric data. Just remember the candle. Assumptions, assumptions, assumptions. Okay. Moving on here, we're almost done to be happy to hear. <laughs> Everybody got a headache yet? Helium diffusion rate, this is something I'm sure you've all been dying to know about. <laughs> Alright, it's been known for decades that there's too much helium in the rocks and not enough in the atmosphere. You say, well, okay, who cares? Remember when we talked about that decay process and the helium atom? <coughs> as a part of this uranium decaying all the way down to lead, and they're working their way out of the rocks. Well, nobody, they, they knew there's, first of all, if the atmosphere was really as old as the Earth as they say it is, why don't we talk like this? Because it'd be, too, have you ever done that with a balloon? You know, it distorts your voice with the helium. There'd be a lot more helium in the atmosphere. So they know there's not enough. Nobody ever bothered to calibrate it or measure it and find out, okay, until, one, one uh, of these uh, PhD scientists in the rate project did that. So they know that it was, it was too high in the rocks, too low in the air. They also know, uh, I think they knew this before, uh, maybe not because they hadn't measured it until he did, but the, the higher the temperature, the faster that it migrates out of the rocks and into the air. All right, so what he did was uh, he took samples, and these are ones that were uh, I can't remember now where all he, he went for these, but he checked it at different levels uh, down into the earth and different temperatures, measured the temperatures. And he projected ahead of time, you know, what is this going to look like? And if the, uh, if the earth is really four and a half billion years old, then down at the bottom here, this is the uniformitarian model, and you'll see some error bars there, this little square, and then the error bars to allow for possible errors in it, but depending on and the temperature down here at the bottom, the hotter it gets, you know, the more they escape. So you would find levels like this if the Earth is really four and a half billion years old. If the Earth is only of the biblical age, around six thousand <coughs> years, then you find this graph up here. So that was the projection. Alright, now I'm not sure if you can tell where you're sitting, but you'll see some of these are filled in with black dots. Guess what the black dots are? The actual measurements. Right smack in the middle of the <coughs> bars. A factor of 100,000 difference. That's why we don't have any more helium in the atmosphere and it's still in the rocks because the Earth is not 4.5 billion years old. This is dynamite. And no one has refuted it. I've got another video of his, maybe we can show it here some other time, where he answers a few critics and where they say, well, how about this, what about that? He's got answers for all that. Um, so I'm gonna, what I'm going to show you here in just a little bit is about a five-minute video uh, where he, the, the Dr. Humphreys himself, is showing what he went through here and the, and the significance of all this, and it's pretty fascinating stuff. He can do it a lot better than I can. But uh, before that, I will show you some resources. and. Uh, I mentioned before this uh, rate project, radioisotopes in the age of the earth. This is book one, and this is something that they put out uh, around 2000 that says, here are the research areas we're going to investigate, here's what our research is going to be, here's what we're going to try to find out, okay. Book two is what they found out in a lot of different, in all these areas that they were, they were each, each guy was working on a different thing there. And, uh, Yes, it's really loaded with uh, physics and graphs and math and charts and all that if you really like that sort of thing. If uh, for some reason you don't, they make a great doorstop. <laughs> these, these puppies are almost seven pounds a piece. I mean, this is that real heavy paper, you know. This is really good stuff. But it is, it's, it's, it's groundbreaking work. It's great. When did that second one come out? 
Uh, the second one was in, uh, I think, about 2004 or five. Uh, 2005, yeah. So, but it was now it was actually an eight-year project. So it was it took them a couple of, couple of years into it just to decide what they want to try to figure out. And uh, that's in the here's what we're going to look for and see what we can find out. And here's what we found out. Okay. Now, if you don't need a doorstop or you're not into the heavy physics, here's the book for you. It's those condensed into thousands, not billions. And it covers each one of those uh, areas that they did. And very easy to, to understand, very well done. And it also comes with a, well, we're going to see one segment of, a DVD that kind of covers what's in the book. Thousands, not billions. Really fascinating stuff. And uh, uh, I'll just mention very briefly that there's another segment in here that wasn't part of their original plan, but they were saying, look, we're basing our thoughts on the Bible and what is written in God's Word, so we sh shouldn't we be pretty sure that what we're looking at here was intended as history? And so they had a Hebrew professor, and he teamed up with a, uh, a statistician, some guy that, that really does this stuff in detail. Are you familiar with that, what happened? Uh, and the idea was, because Genesis has been criticized, some people will say, well, it's just poetry. It's just allegory. You know, it's not historical record or, or fact. And so he said, well, let's, let's kind of test that using the language, and he used the Hebrew language. And it turns out that there are certain verbs that seem to be associated with narrative uh, writing as opposed to poetic writing. And again, Hebrew poetry is just it's a different kind of form. It doesn't mean it's not true. Um, and it doesn't even necessarily rhyme, I don't think, but it's, it's just a different structure. But uh, like there are preterites, and I'm not a grammar guy, so I have to go back and read it all over to understand. But anyway, he did this, this study. And the way he did the study was he took, I think, 16 examples each. I don't remember the exact number. But he took some samples of, of Old Testament writing in Hebrew that everyone agrees is narrative history. Okay? No one, you can't find anybody to say, no, I don't think so. These, everybody agrees on. Okay? So they, they study this verb usage there. And another set of examples, I think about 16, everybody agrees this is poetry, Hebrew poetry, different style. No arguments. So they uh, uh, come up with those examples, and, they, and there's a chart, something like this one here, that shows here's what it looks like, the way this verb usage goes when it's narrative history, and here's what it looks like when it's poetry. Then they went back to Genesis chapters 1 to 11, and they did the same test on that. And it came out totally on the line of narrative history, even more so in some cases than the stuff that everybody agrees on. It is absolutely clear that the authors, Moses and God, intended this to be read as narrative history and nothing else. This is a historical account. And that the, the, his work is in here, in this book too. And uh, so that, that made the folks feel a little better. So here's what we're relying on the Bible. So, they, so the people that, you can choose not to believe that, certainly, but you can't say, that the Bible wasn't trying to tell us that this was historical stuff we're writing down here because the way the language is used, it certainly was. So uh, we have a picture of a thousand of billions there, and we'll get Dr. Russ Humphreys to tell you. Okay. So he is rounding off a little bit when he says 6,000, and his notes will find it's actually like 5,832 plus or minus 1,900. Something rather, but when he rounds off, it's six thousand plus or minus two thousand. So uh, that's uh, close enough, and a lot closer than four and a half billion. So uh, now there is a there is a problem to be dealt with here. When did this happen? Was it a part of the creation week? Was some of it happened? They think during the flood. Uh, advance or rapid decay like this can produce a lot of heat. 
So at this last ICC conference that Diane and I went to back in August, he did a presentation, um, and I can't even tell you exactly now what all. It was kind of up, up here, but uh, I think again using Einstein's theory of relativity among other things, uh, he's come up with what he thinks is a reasonable explanation for how that can happen and uh, make it work. So very, very fascinating stuff. <coughs> of course, we do have an eyewitness that says how old things are, and so many other uh, examples that, uh, that cover that. So again, when uh, Russ Humphreys did these tests, he's getting an age of the Earth approximately. 6,000 years plus or minus 2,000 years. Uh, and I was just reading something the other day, and I forget who it was, that, was, that his, it might have been John Woodmore, but this is another book I forgot to mention, uh, Mythology of Modern Dating Methods. He goes through here, and it just goes page after page. Uh, myth, on theoretical grounds, concordant results by different dating methods are virtually conclusive proof for the accuracy of the dates obtained. And then he goes on and says, here's the truth. <laughs> page after page of that. Very well researched. And uh, again, if you like dipping into the physics. But so they really, they, they'll cast aside. And he, I think he might be the one, or another author I was reading, has asked evolutionists all over the place, give me an example of evolution, please. Give me a solid example. And he has met with silence. And yet, they make. TV series about it. That someday we'll do in here maybe the presentation I do on the, uh, the PBS evolution series. Eight hours worth. One thing after another. And yet, you know, they don't. Now, as I say, some people are true believers. Others know they're fibbing. Hmm. But the alternative is unacceptable to them. You know, if this, if I can't explain things naturally by a bunch of accidents over a long period of time, there's got to be a God. And I'm accountable. <clears throat> and I'm not having that. So there, are, you know, there are, there are some in that category, and others. And and you know, if you get to interviewing scientists in various fields, like, you know, when somebody gets a PhD, like I think we referred to Dr. Jason Lyle in here, he's got a PhD in astrophysics. He studied some minute thing having to do with the sun. I mean, he is an expert on this one thing. And that's what PhDs, when they're studying things, they really focus in on something. And uh, so they don't necessarily know the other things going around. So you, you can interview a lot of different scientists in different fields. And it could be a geologist. And you'll say, well, uh, probably more likely you get into well, biology, let's say. And, does your research into the stinger length of the bumblebee or whatever you're studying, is that supported by evolutionary theory? And I said, well, actually no, but you know, everybody else, you know, he figures all the other guys that have done their research, so he's not going to fight, go upstream here. Uh, when, when stuff he's been looking at, you know, well, it doesn't make sense. And uh, there's a, there's a, Chinese paleontologist, I'm not going to be able to think of his name, but he's well thought of all around the world, you know, researcher paleontologist in China, and he came over here doing a lecture tour around the United States. This has been 10, 12, 15 years ago, I think. It's been a while. And as part of his discussion of the stuff he's, he's looked at, at one point he says, <clears throat> the uh, the fossil record in China does not support the Darwinian model. And man, he was persona non grata. From that, he was attacked. All the scientific publications and everything, they just, they just jumped all over him, which prompted him to say, well, you know, in China, you can uh, criticize Darwin, but you cannot criticize the government. And lock you up. In America, you can criticize the government, but you cannot criticize Darwin. And so that's kind of the mindset. That, uh, you know, they just not really. They 
haven't been taught that way. There have been no, you know, from the time you're in school, from the kindergarten on, you're taught evolution is fact. And all these things that, you know, it's in the textbook, it's got to be true. So they're not questioning there. They go on to college and they're taught by the professors who were taught the same thing. And so it's really tough. There's, there's so many examples, a lot of examples of um, folks who were atheists, who were evolutionists, and they got into their science and looking at things. And now that's not the normal way. The most normal way for these guys is they got saved first. They came to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, and then they decided, you know, they're reading their Bible saying, you know, this doesn't compute, so I better take a look. And then they start realizing that evolution is kind of a fairy tale. But there are others who just, like Dr. Jerry Bergman, who on the scientific basis alone, as he's looking at us, you know, this isn't right, this isn't right, this isn't right. And as he got deeper and deeper into it, then he became a Christian as a result. But we're going to look at that at some point, I don't know when, We'll do a thing on dinosaurs, and I have a video clip from, uh, I should be able to play it on here, it's a DVD. It's a little segment from 60 Minutes. I mean, if it's on 60 Minutes, it's got to be true, right? <clears throat> so, uh, Leslie Stahl interviewed Dr. Uh, what's Mary her name? Schweitzer. Thank you. Dr. Mary Schweitzer. She, now that I'm losing my faculties, she's my faculty. We just can't lose the same thing, same job. <laughs> Checking the account number, we're good. <laughs> Dr. Barry Schweitzer is the one who did this, this, these bones from Hell, Hell's Creek. And, and somebody asked, you know, the guys are out there digging these bones up, and I said, man, this stinks. It's, yeah, all those bones up there stink. Well, it shouldn't stink after 65 million years. Anyway, so she, they, they like I said, they had to saw this thing in half because they couldn't get it in the helicopter. It was too big uh, to, to lift it and go study. It was a big thigh bone from a T-Rex. And she you know, took some shavings in the lab there. She was in, uh, I think it's a university down in North Carolina. I'm not sure which one. And uh, they, they found, like you said, red blood cells. They found soft, flexible, connective tissue. And she wrote it all up. She didn't believe it herself. She is an evolutionist. She didn't believe it. But she's also a scientist who trusts her work. She had her lab people that did it over and over and over again to double check. Got the same results. Then they tested another of hadrosaur bones, supposed to be 80 million years old, get the same results. And so she sent that off to be published and uh, to various, I don't know what, science journals. They kicked it right back. And she said, she wrote him back and says, well, what, what's it missing? What do I need to do uh, for you to publish these results of my experiment? And they said, there's nothing you can do. We're not going there. Now that was, some, a few years went by and she kept, you know, finally they did publish and then they're, they're all folks saying, well, there's contamination and there's this and there's that and all that has been refuted. And, uh, but this 60 Minutes clip is fascinating because they show so they've got taking a, a video through the microscope and it shows the lab tech with the tweezers on this supposedly 65 million year old T-Rex bone and in there and this soft tissue pulls it with a tweezer, it's like a rubber band it pulls out and it snaps back and and Leslie Stahl, the intrepid investigative reporter, this is impossible. This bone is 65 or 68 million years old. And I want to go, Leslie, hello, maybe it's not that old. Don't you think a 60 Minutes reporter, if they've done all these things where they dig out everything, would say, well, now wait a minute. Couldn't it possibly be? And I'll bet you she did, and I'll bet you Mary Schweitzer told her, don't you dare ask me that question. We're not going, we're not doing it. I'll bet you. Now Schweitzer stands by her research, and so what's her answer? Well, this makes logical sense. There must be some miraculous means of preservation that we don't know about. <laughs> 
that can let these red blood cells and the soft connective tissue hold up for 65 million years when it shouldn't. We're lucky. I think this guy died in the flood. We're lucky that there's any red blood cells there after 4,300 years. Certainly can't be millions of years. But they're much more willing to believe that, boy, somebody, there's some, some process that will preserve. Boy, if they find out what that is, hey, the fountain of youth, right? <laughs> uh, they're, they're rather, they would rather believe that than, wait a minute, this guy was around here more recently. And which when we get to talk about dinosaurs, we'll see plenty of evidence of that. So, but yeah, I, you don't see what you don't want to see.